Um, so yeah, my name is Daniel, and uh, I'm with Renew.org, and I want to encourage you to check out our table back there. We've got some really great uh, resources. That's Mike Roster back there, but he waved a mic. And uh, yeah, we've, I, I just want to mention the theology books that we're releasing this year called Real Life Theology. I mean, they, they really are going to be some helpful stuff. You can go through them with, with your small groups. You can go through them with your church. Um, but I mean, it, it's a serious theology series that we're just starting to put out. Uh, we've got two books out, Holy Spirit and, and Disciple Making. So it's going to be 12 total. Uh, anyway, just go check it out. Uh, so today I get to talk with you about skepticism. Now, what is skepticism? Anybody want to take a stab at kind of what that is? I mean, yeah, anybody? Raise your hand. Somebody? Uh, anybody who twitches, I'm going to call on you probably. So, uh, yeah, well, yeah, what's skepticism? Yeah, yeah, when you doubt it, but it's also true. Yeah, that's a really good, good way to put it. So we're here to, like, cancel skepticism in us. Now, are we ever going to be able to completely eradicate doubt from our hearts when it comes to things of God? I don't think so, honestly. I think, I mean, God has never given us so much uh, proof that, like, we can never doubt. Like, we'll always, there will always be the potential to doubt. But when it comes to skepticism, when it comes to cynicism, it becomes more of a heart thing. And it's not just a matter of doubting once in a while. It's, it's a matter of like this deep-seated distrust of God. So I, th- I think it's possible for all of us to be there. That's what we're going to talk about today. I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to kind of launch into this. So let's pray. God, thank you so much for this church. Thank you for CMU. I thank you for the enthusiasm I see here. I thank you for the zeal. I thank you for the, the disciple-making that's going on. This is incredible stuff. And uh, I just pray that what I say is helpful today. Um, I pray that it helps deepen our faith. I pray that it helps us to have a faith uh, for the long haul, um, a faithful faith uh, that endures. We love you, Lord, and it's in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so again, the cultural lie I want to help us to kind of train for is the, is the idea that you can't trust God. Um, it's literally the oldest lie in the book. You can't trust God. Um, so in order to train you for that moment, because it'll happen, I want to teach you about two realities that are out there. They both rhyme, and here they are, uh, two realities you need to know about for that moment when the tempter comes to you and says, you know what, you can't trust God. Here's the first reality. It's the haze, H-A-Z-E, the haze that clouds up our vision. And the second one is the rays, R-A-Y-S, that cut through the haze. So again, the haze that clouds up our vision, and number two, the rays uh, that cut through the haze. So number one, we live in a haze, okay? A confusing, disorienting haze. Um, In C.S. Lewis's children's book, Silver Chair, raise your hand if you've read that, Silver Chair. Very cool, it's a great book. Um, It's in his Chronicles of Narnia series. Uh, You have two children and a marsh wiggle, and I don't have time to talk about what a marsh wiggle is, but two children and a marsh wiggle are sent to find the missing prince, Rillian, uh, and they journey all over to find this missing prince, and uh, they find him, and he's underground. Not just like a few feet underground, but there's this whole like realm underground where they discover him, and this underground realm is ruled by a sorceress, and the sorceress has kept Prince Rillian, a ca- you know, a captive under her spell in this underground realm this whole time. Now, we'll need to skip some details, but they find the prince, and they're able to help him snap out of his spell, and it has something to do with a silver chair, which is why the book is called Silver Chair, and they're about to make their getaway. They're about to make their escape uh, when the sorceress comes in, and uh, the witch, and it's absolutely fascinating because uh, she starts out not by saying, how dare you try to take the prince? She doesn't get angry. Rather, she talks with them, and she, uh, almost like in a, a smooth, almost like a cute way, and uh, she doesn't call the guards. She just takes some powder. She sprinkles it in the fireplace, and she starts to strum on a stringed instrument. She's pretending like nothing's the matter. It's kind of a, a little random, and... Uh, and then she asks some questions. She says, okay, so where are you off to? They say, well, we're off to Narnia. She's like, Narnia? What, what's this place called Narnia? And they're like, well, it's, it's up there. And uh, how? She laughs. Uh, is there like a country up there among the mortar on the, on the roof? No, no, it's an overworld. Um, 
they explained, you know, the, the world that's over our world. What? Over world? That doesn't make any sense. And her enchantment is starting to work on their minds. And, uh, but, but we've seen the sun uh, up there in the sky. And she's like, well, what is the sun? What does that word mean? And after more questions, she's, they've become convinced that the sun must have just been an illusion. Well, there's Aslan. He's the great lion remembers one, mustering the last bit of energy that she can, or the last bit of memory, and, and the witch responds, well, what's, what's Aslan? Well, he's a lion. Well, what's a lion? And pretty soon, well, they, they say it's a cat. And, well, I love cats. And pretty soon they, they think that the lion must just be something that they dreamt up based on the idea of cats. Soon they've accepted that overworld, which is kind of like our heaven, um, is just a dream that they piece together uh, based on the things they'd seen in the real, the real world, the down here world. Uh, it was just a dream. See, they, they were living in a haze. We are living in a haze. Um, if you've ever watched the Lord of the Rings movies or, or read any of the Lord of the Rings books by J.R.R. Tolkien, you know that Gandalf the wizard is a good guy or a bad guy. He's a good guy, right? Uh, he helps the good guys fight the orcs. He, he helps Frodo and Sam destroy the ring. Gandalf is definitely the good guy, right? Except in the book, The Two Towers, there's a king who's convinced that Gandalf is not the good guy, thinks that he's actually the bad guy. In fact, this, this king is, is convinced that Gandalf is a terrible guy. Now, what's the king's name, anybody? Theoden, right? And uh, why doesn't Theoden trust Gandalf? Anybody know? Because he's got somebody whispering. What's his name? It's an advisor. He's whispering, Grima Wormtongue, right? And, uh, and, and he's saying, oh, you can't trust that guy. He's got this guy whispering to him, telling him he can't trust him. So King Theoden is living in this haze, and we are too. Um, ever seen the movie Charade? Anybody? It's an old movie. It's, uh, it's got Cary Grant, Audrey Hepburn. It's like, an, it's like an Alfred Hitchcock movie, but it actually wasn't made by him. It was very similar to Hitchcock feel. Um, but anyway, um, in, in this movie, uh, Audrey Hepburn, her husband dies and uh, he's been murdered. Turns out he'd been a thief, and he'd kind of cheated his fellow thieves out of some of the money. And so the thieves are still around, and they think that Audrey Hepburn must have the money. And at the same time, this nice guy, Cary Grant, keeps showing up, and Cary Grant befriends Audrey Hepburn, and she begins to trust him. But then one of the thieves tells her that Cary Grant is actually one of the thieves as well, and he's in it for the money. So she doesn't know what to think. And, uh, and so she confronts Cary Grant, uh, and uh, Cary Grant explains that, well, he's just pretending to be a thief, but he's actually one of the good guys. And this actually happens a total of four times throughout the movie where Audrey Hepburn thinks she knows who he is, but she keeps being told, actually, he's this other person. And at the end of the movie, there's this very confused Audrey Hepburn. Long story short, she's had the treasure all along. She just didn't know it. And so she's holding on to the treasure, and two men are on either side of her. Both are telling her to come their way. One of them, Cary Grant saying, I really am one of the good guys. The other one's saying, you can't trust him. Bring the treasure to me. Audrey Hepburn was caught in a haze. We're living in the haze too. And the haze has a name. And the name of the haze is slander. What is slander? Well, anybody know what, what slander is? Raise your hand if you've got a definition for slander. Is it true or not? Yeah, go ahead. False accusation designed to do what? To damage the reputation, to hurt somebody. These are lies meant to hurt, right? And so uh, you and I live in the haze of a slandered God. Hurtful lies that have been said about God. We're living in that haze. These hurtful lies about God, these, these slanders against God, they confuse us. So that sometimes it's hard to know whom to trust or what to think. Uh, and do you know how it all started, this haze about God? It started out like, kind of like a witch innocently strumming her instrument and asking cute questions. Uh, I need someone to read for me, uh, Genesis chapter 3. Anybody, could anybody find Genesis chapter 3? We're going to spend a little time in there. As soon as you've got Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, I'll just call on you to read. If, Ronnie, go for it. Just verse 1 there. Genesis 1? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Ronnie. So let's get a little context 
uh, God had told Adam and Eve that they can eat from what? All the trees, right? Uh, and then the serpent comes. I mean, so there's a ton of freedom there. But then the serpent comes along and says, wait, 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 wait. Let me guess. God probably told you you can't eat from any of the trees, right? Did he pull that one on you? I bet he's always pulling stuff like that. Now, what is Satan doing here? He's planting the thought that says, you can't trust God. This catches Eve off guard. And then verse 2 and 3. Okay, and then slander is going to get a little bolder, and it's just going to decide to come right out and just, just say it. You know what? God is a liar. Slander says this is verse 4 and 5. So the serpent slanders God, and then guess what? Slander works. Look at verse 6 and 7. The woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom. She took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig trees together. Slander worked splendidly. Satan had introduced a haze, and Eve was like, well, maybe God is the bad guy. And maybe the serpent's on to something. Maybe this fruit is just what I've been missing. She eats, Adam eats, and the haze just spreads and spreads until it engulfs everything. And then verse 8. Yeah, do you catch what happened there? I mean, the haze has spread to where things are so upside down that they don't even trust God anymore. Like the, the haze of distrust, and then comes sin, and then comes guilt, and, uh, and then the cycle just starts over again. As guilt whispers, like Grima Wormtongue, you can't trust him. God's the enemy. Oh, no, he's coming. Run. More distrust, more sin, more guilt, more slander. And then check this out. Slander begets slander. Uh, this is verse 9 to 11. Listen to, how, uh, listen to what happens next, 9, 9 to 11. Uh, 11. And then um, listen to what Adam says next. This is verse 12. And listen to what slander does to Adam. Go ahead, verse 12. Yeah, thanks so much, man. Satan has slandered God, and now who's slandering God? Adam, right? Slander begets slander. Um you know, it's not my fault. It's your fault. You're the one who gave me this woman, and it's her fault too. It's not my fault. Lies meant to hurt. Slander. You see, Satan slanders God, which is meant to get us to sin, and then every time we sin, we slander God. Slander is a way of, of, of or sorry, sin is a way of slandering God. It's my way of saying, you know what? I, I can't trust God. I can't trust his way of doing things. I got to do it my, I got to do things my way, and because I can't trust God, uh, you know, I, I do it my way, and, and that's just a way of, of slandering God. And then, so Satan gets us to slander, or he, he slanders God, he hands it to us, says, now you give it a try. And listen, if Satan was able to get Adam and Eve to slander God when things were perfect, now that things are really fallen and there's evil everywhere, Satan doesn't even have to try. Distrusting God, running away from God, uh, believing lies and spreading lies about God, it's just become humanity's way of life. All of this, this is your fault, God. It's not our fault. We live in a haze, the haze of the slandered God. 
So to train you for that moment when the tempter comes to you and says, you can't trust in God, it's going to be really important for you to remember that, first of all, we are living in a confusing, disorienting haze. God has been slandered. And sometimes it's hard to know right from wrong and down from up. Uh, it's hard to know whom to trust sometimes. It's hard to know whom to run away from. Life down here can be so hazy that you can't just rely on your gut. You can't just assume that you're thinking rightly, um, that, that your value system is right side up. You can't assume that. Life down here is kind of like when you're reading the book Screw Tape Letters uh, by C.S. Lewis, where you have to constantly, this is the book that's written, you know, it's, it's fiction, but it's written from a demon to another demon on how to tempt a human. And as you're reading this book, you're constantly having to remind yourself, okay, when it says our father, it's talking about Satan. And when, it's, when it says uh, the enemy, it's talking about God, and as you're reading that, you got to constantly remind yourself, everything's upside down. It's kind of like when I took a youth group to Kansas City to an escape room, and you're locked in a room, you have to figure out the clues, and this clue leads to the next clue, and hopefully by the end of the hour, you've found the key and you can get out of the room. But in this room that we were in, literally everything was upside down. The couch was was hanging from the ceiling upside down. Uh, you watch a TV, but you have to turn your head in order to be able to see it. At every point in the game, as you're trying to figure out this clue or that clue, you got to remember, read the clue as if it's upside down. Read everything as if it's upside down. That's life down here. It's the haze that we live in. Is God friend or enemy? Does God want what's best for me? Or does God even care? Is the Bible meant to set me free? or to steal my joy. And in the haze of a slandered God, life down here can be extremely confusing. So, number one, the haze that clouds up our vision. Number two, the rays, R-A-Y-S, the rays that cut through the haze. We humans, we live in a confusing, disorienting haze about God, and that's why it helps to know that in the haze, God has sent rays of truth, rays that slice through the haze, and they help us to know up from down. I was at a funeral once, a funeral was for a, a woman, a pastor's wife, actually, um, and the pastor was speaking at the funeral. He was talking about how she died just a really cruel death of, of uh, cancer, and by the end, it was just this, you know, she was just in this swirling jumble of confusion and pain, and uh, in and out of con consciousness, just a lot of pain, and that toward the end, he would get close to her, he'd get his face close to hers, and he would speak some truths for her to hang on to. He'd say, you know, your kids love you, I love you, your church loves you, Jesus loves you. And he would tell her these truths to, to give her something to hold on to through the confusion and the pain. Your kids love you, I love you, your church loves you, Jesus loves you. I'm just really thankful that God gives us those rays of truth to hang on to during the haze. You remember uh, the, tw the 2011 Joplin tornado, Joplin, Missouri. Um, you know, took out a lot of the town, businesses, schools, uh, my favorite guitar shop, um, St. Mary's Catholic School or Catholic Church. It was all destroyed and um, 161 people dead. Now, it could have been way more, but still 161 people. The tornado didn't make sense. And I remember one of the headlines was that in St. Mary's Catholic Church, it was destroyed, but in the midst of the rubble, standing alone was a, steel, a tall steel cross. It was still there. And some believers might have thought, oh, it's a miracle, um, or at least, you know, providence. Uh, skeptics probably didn't think much of it, you know. I mean, Joplin has a lot of crosses, probably just random, and the fact is a lot of people died. After all, after something that devastating, and that confusing, what message can a cross that's still standing, what message can that possibly tell us? Here's what it tells us. It tells us enough. The cross tells us amidst the haze and the confusion and the pain and the devastation and all the, why did this happen? And why is this world so broken? And why didn't God answer my prayers for such and such? The cross tells us that whatever the answer to those questions, whatever the answer to those questions, the cross tells us that the answer cannot be that God doesn't care. You know, through 2,000 years of, of haze, the cross still stands and tells us that whatever the reason, 
for this or that. We know it can't be that God doesn't care. Okay, he cares. So the cross is, is a ray that cuts through the slander. Um, and at this time, what I'd like to do is I'd like to open it up to, to um, hear from some of the maybe older people in the, uh, in the room who have you know, been through a bit. Um, what are some rays that, you know, y- y- I'm sure you've had junk you've gone through. What have been some of the rays that God has given that has, has really helped you to be able to know up from down, uh, be able to still hang on to God during those difficult times? Does that question make sense? Like, what are, what are some of the rays that, um, you know, in, in your years, the, the difficult times that you've been able to still say, you know what, I can still trust in God? Any, yeah, go for it. My church family. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. What else? Yeah. Remembering past victories. Yeah. So good. Yeah. Like, like the pile of stones, for example, the Israelites set up after, you know, they crossed through the, yeah. Just the consequences of sin. It's almost like what um, TC. The time that Jesus preached a sermon that was so unpopular that basically everybody left except for the 12. Um, this is after he fed the 5,000. He preaches a sermon, and uh, it's so uncomfortable because he's saying things like, you got to eat my flesh and drink my blood, and people are like, this is too hard. We can't do this. So, like, everybody leaves. He turns to the 12, and he says, you guys going to leave too? And does anybody remember what Peter said? Yeah. Who else are we going to go to? Like, like Ronnie's saying, is like, I mean, there may be times that you don't feel super connected with God, or maybe you're a little bit frustrated with God. I, you know, that can happen. But, and, and so on, on days like that, you can still say, along with Peter, well, who else are we going to go to? You know, I, I, know what, I know what that path leads to. I know what that path leads to. It's not good. I'm going to keep hanging on to God. I'm going to keep hanging on to Christ. Um, who else has something? Yeah. Say again? The babies. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. When, when my wife and I had a miscarriage, um, it really helped that we got to go home to a kid, you know, one of our oldest was, was there, and it's like, okay, God is good. You know, sometimes babies, kids, they can really, really be that reminder. Who else has something? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 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 that's good, that's good. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, yep. That's awesome. Like, yeah, get let. You look around. It's like every every breath is a gift. It really is. It really is. Yeah. Maybe one more. Yeah. Mhm. Yeah. Mhm. Yeah, man. 
God's grace is always there. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> we, we totally need it. I need it every day. Um, so, uh, yeah, it, it, maybe one more. I, I'd love to hear just one more maybe. Um, yeah, go for it. It's such a good reminder that God can use even even the darkest tragedies for good things. And and what is what is our proof that He does that? Because He does it. And we we've all been there, right? Where where something bad has happened, and yet it's it's clear that God has used it for something good. And, and like He's there, he, you know. But what is what is the definitive proof? The best example of God taking like the worst thing that could possibly happen and use it for good. The cross. Yep. Yep. I mean, I mean, there, no greater tragedy, no greater injustice could be imagined, and yet God took that to, and used it to save the world. Um, so, the rays that He sends us, those rays of truth, of of hope that slice through the slander, keep on the lookout for those. That's, that's going to be really helpful. Um, I want to transition to talking about some really practical, like responses that we can have when we have those temptations of you know slandering God. Um, but before we do that, I, I'm going to see if Mike uh, could pass around our. Um, oh, is, is there any, is somebody have been? Hey, Mike, where are you at? I'm very incoherent here, but the, he's got a, an email subscriber list. I would love for him to pass that through. If if you would like to subscribe to Renew.org, get free stuff every Monday, Wednesday, Friday through our emails. Uh, just become aware of what's going on with Renew. Um, totally recommend it. Uh, it's a lot, of, a lot of great content and stuff. So anyway, if you want to give your email, that would be awesome. Um, yeah, Mike, please. This is a, is a wonderful network. I, in fact, let me just tell you just quickly, how much time do I have? 12.05, is that we're, when we're getting out? Okay, so just real quick, what Renew is, Renew.org is a network of people who encourage each other towards faithfulness, and, and we uh, write articles for each other. We do videos. We, we have gatherings, online events, that sort of thing. So Carrie has written articles for us. Ronnie has participated in articles for us, and it's just a way of encouraging each other towards faithfulness. We really need that, uh, and, and so it's, it's, uh, it's a great way to connect and to, and to be encouraged and to encourage other people. So um, that's it in a nutshell. Let's, let's move on now. Actually, let me give away another book real quick, um, just because that's, that's kind of fun. So, uh, the Phoenix Suns last night, who was the, the top scorer the Phoenix Suns? Last night? Last night? Devin, Devin Book? Uh, what's his last name? Booker. Booker, you got it. All right. So, this is, uh, this is a book that, it wasn't Renew, but it was, uh, it's a world religions book. It's kind of fun. Um, so, all right, one, one more uh, book giveaway real quick. Um, does anybody know what the Buddha's actual name was? Somebody said it, I think. What is it? Siddhartha. Siddhartha. Search for the G. Gautama. Yeah, very good. Who said Gautama? All right, you get this one. Can I throw this to you? Is that all right? All right, ready? Okay. okay. <laughs> all right. And well done. Okay, so let's transition to talk about some, some of the most common slanders um, that, uh, that Satan will throw at us about God. Okay, so here's the first one, and what I'll do is I'll throw out this slander, and then I'm going to let you kind of respond to it, and then I'll, if, if, if there's still some time, I'll share some thoughts about it as well. But here's the first slander that you'll hear, and number one, God causes evil. God causes evil. Um, everything that happens, you know, happens for a reason, as they say, so therefore, God must be the author of evil. Um, so how would you respond to that when, when Satan throws that slander at you? God causes evil. Anybody want to take a stab at that? Yeah. 
There can't be any good without evil. Okay, I, I'm going to tweak that just a little bit. I think you're on the right track, okay? I would say there cannot be any evil without good, for sure. I would definitely say that um, because evil presupposes that there's a standard, right? You don't get a standard unless there's a standard of good. So evil really can't exist by itself. And that's a really, really important point. Um, the, the idea that, um, yeah, that evil could just kind of be a thing that God created, it's actually, it doesn't make any sense. Because evil is like a parasite. It, it has to corrupt something that's good. You can't really think of anything that's just pure evil. It's always evil because you're trying to get at something good in a wrong way, you know. So, uh, yeah, go ahead, Landon. Yeah, absolutely. That, that's, that's a huge, it's kind of the elephant in the room. It's like, it's, God's given us the choice, right? I mean, it, it's not, not always that we we're happy about that, but he's given it to us. So he, in some sense, God must value our choice, which, what does that tell us about him? He's loving, right? Love, love has to be free, otherwise it's, it's not love. Love has to, it, love cannot be forced, so in some sense, God must have cared about our freedom because he cared about love. There, there, um, here's how I'll, I'll put it as well. Anybody else want to share their, a response to the idea that God causes evil? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's right. That, yeah, that's a really good point. Um, Martin Luther King Jr. stood against a culture, and he said, hey, this is wrong. We, we need to be more, um, you know, we, we need to treat people fairly, okay? He was right, even though the culture said he was wrong. Well, how is that possible? The, the, the only way that, like, even if, even if he was the only one on the planet saying that, he would still be right. Right? Or, or even, I mean, put it, put it this way. Let's say that Hitler had won, and now everybody's a Nazi, and he's brainwashed everybody on the planet. Everybody on the planet thinks it's, it's a good thing to kill Jewish people, okay? Would they be right because now everybody thinks that way? No. He'd still be wrong. And, how, and, and we know that deep within. We know that there are certain things that are right, certain things are wrong, regardless of what people think, regardless of how they live. And if, if there's a, a set right and a set wrong, regardless of the way people think, the only way that can be the case is if there is a, starts with a G, a God. I mean, it, it, it really is, it is that logical. Like, um, so, uh, yeah, good, good thoughts there. I, I'll say this as far as the idea that God causes evil. Um, there was a time when, my, when Sarah, one of my daughters, was a five-year-old, and um, she, uh, she could only write... No, no, all she would ever write was her name, and I love daddy, and I love mommy. And we loved it. We thought, this is so great. Uh, cause, and the, the reason why that's all she would write is because that's all that she knew how to write, right? And so we, my wife and I even talked about it, like, oh, it's kind of great. Let's, let's not teach her anymore. But we did. You know, we taught her more. And uh, now she can, you know, then she was able to, you know, write things like daddy is tootie pants and that sort of thing. Now, she had the skills, the vocabulary. Would I ever cause her to write Daddy is Tootie Pants? Would I ever be like, hey, write this? No. But uh, so what we did was we gave her the skills, the tools to be able to do that. And then she's able to what? Yeah, make choices, right? God's done the same thing with us. Um, he's given us the freedom. And uh, it's, it's a wonderful gift. It's a wonderful gift called free will. But a lot of us, well, all of us have, have misused it in bad ways. Um, Henry Ford, when he created the what? Yeah, like, that's a good thing, right? Yeah, but it also enabled some really bad things, right? You know, some car accidents, that sort of thing. So even though an automobile is a good thing, it enables some, some evil if people use it wrong. It's the same with freedom. So God doesn't cause evil. In fact, I want to read this scripture here that I think puts things in a really good perspective. Uh, this is when, um, when Jesus is weeping over the city of Jerusalem. And here's what he says. This is Matthew 23, verse 37. Listen to the wording here. Jesus says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. 
He says, how often I wanted to gather your children together the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were unwilling. God doesn't cause evil. He gives freedom, and we make choices. He doesn't cause it, but he definitely fights evil, and that's a good thing. Uh, second slander. So the first one, God causes evil. Here's the second one. And hopefully, I love that you guys are writing some of this stuff down. Hopefully, you're hearing some things that are helpful because these are slanders that you'll hear. Here's the second one. God doesn't care. Okay? Um, it's like the 1996 Point of Grace pop Christian song called Jesus Doesn't Care. Isn't that a great name for a, a song? Jesus doesn't care. You know what? Jesus doesn't care. Uh, anyway, I'm sure they meant something different. But... Uh, uh, Les Miserables, opening song, it's an opera, probably have it here in St. Louis, I suppose, but uh, there's a song where this chain gang is singing over and over, look down, look down, don't look them in the eye, look down, look down, you're here until you die, and a prisoner sings, I've done no wrong, sweet Jesus, hear my prayer, and the prisoners all respond, look down, look down, sweet Jesus doesn't care. How do you respond? That's proof, right? That's, that's, that's definitive proof, the cross, right? Absolutely. That whatever the answer to all these difficult questions, it cannot be that God doesn't care. Um, there's a guy named Os Guinness who wrote a book on suffering, and he, he, said, um, he said, I don't know why my wife has cancer. I don't know why this or that. Um, he says, but I do know why I trust God who knows why. Let me say that again, because that's, that's a pretty good thought to kind of lodge in your mind whenever that slander comes along. I don't know why, and you fill in the blank, because you, you've been through stuff. I don't know why this. I don't know why that. I don't know why God didn't answer this prayer. I don't know why, but I do know why I trust God who knows why. And that's a, that's a good place to be. We, we know enough, right? Um, any, any other thoughts on that? That God just doesn't care. Amen. Yeah, absolutely. But it will be made right in the end. God does care. He will make it right. There will be justice, and, and, uh, and there will be goodness. Um, slander number three is uh, God stays hidden. This is actually a pretty common one. Why doesn't God show himself more? You know, if he expects people to be saved and come to a knowledge, why, why is he so hidden? Why doesn't he reveal himself more? Um, you know, Early on in our church's life, uh, in, in a former church that I was in, uh, the youth minister decided to do something creative to get people to come to the youth group. And so he decided to uh, make these business cards and then have the kids pass them out at, at church. And the business card, the first one said, hide. <laughs> the next one said, uh, and. The next one said, seek. And then it was like, hide and seek, come to you know, church or whatever. And uh, it, it just totally was not a good idea because people got the card that said hide and they're like, oh, maybe there's a bomb or something. Anyway, um, and the church, uh, well, I mean, the youth group grew by like a whole, well, okay, it didn't grow at all. It didn't grow any. Uh, it was a terrible idea. And all I can say is that the hide card uh, was a really, really bad way to grow a youth group. Uh, meanwhile, the slander is that God hides himself. He doesn't reveal himself. He doesn't show himself. And that's why more people aren't interested, because, of course, hide is a really bad way for God to grow his capital C church. God shouldn't hide himself. So here's, here's what I would say to that. Um, and there is mystery to this. Like, like Dick said, I mean, there's, def, there's definitely mystery. Um, but uh, the truth is God doesn't hide himself. In the garden when Adam and Eve sinned, which Ronnie read about, uh, God came to them. It was actually who, who hid from whom? Yeah, Adam and Eve hid from God, right? We've been hiding in, in various ways. We've been hiding from him ever since, not wanting him to be very involved in our lives. Um, the Bible says that God has revealed himself. This is Romans chapter 1, where he says, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, his divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made. 
God has revealed himself. And then he actually came in person. And then he told us to tell the whole world about him. Okay, So it's not a matter of God hiding. In fact, Jesus you know, told his apostles, he's like, you're going to receive power. You're going to be my witnesses in, in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and re- in remotest parts of the earth. God doesn't hide himself. He wants to make himself known. Here's the fourth one. Uh, if you could respond to this, it'd be great. Number four, God enjoys punishing. He enjoys wrath. What, what would you respond to that? I remember a comedian named Mark Lowry a long time ago. He would talk about when his dad would give him a spanking, and his dad would always say before, now, this is going to hurt me worse than it hurts you. And Mark would always think, well, if that's the case, let's trade places. <laughs> I'm the one who needs the punishment, right? And uh, we all know that a, a good dad doesn't enjoy punishing. <laughs> And yet there's a lot of punishing that happens in the Bible. God has a lot of anger towards sin, wrath toward unrepentance. So could it be that God kind of gets a kick out of it? Does he enjoy punishing? Yeah, go ahead. Hell is the biggest demonstration of God's willingness to let us make our own decisions. You know what I mean? Like, he doesn't, he doesn't want anyone there. But he definitely makes it to where if you don't want him, you don't have to have him. Right? Um, so Jesus, you look at his heart, and he, he predicts the fall of Jerusalem, which happens about 40 years after he, after he leaves. And Jesus did not enjoy the thought of punish, that punishment that was going to happen um, on his people. He, he did not enjoy that thought at all. Uh, right before he gives this prophecy about what's going to happen in 40 years, he says this. Uh, it always says, when, when he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city, and he wept over it. That's the heart of God. Um, Ezekiel 33, verse 11, say to them, as I live, declares the Lord God, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that the wicked turn away, or sorry, turn from his way and live. And then he goes in, it's almost like begging mode, which is a big deal that God would actually beg somebody. He says, turn back, turn back from your evil ways. Why then will you die, O house of Israel? One more scripture here, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 says, the Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you. Praise God that he's patient towards us. I need it. And it says, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to, what's the word? Repentance. Um, number five, lastly, is this one. God hates fun. And I know it's funny, but we think this way sometimes. Like, it's, it's kind of ridiculous, but we do think this way sometimes. The God that just, like, against having a good time. Uh, how would you respond to that? Yeah. Okay, that's right. He's clearly got a sense of humor, right? How do you explain the platypus? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's so true. That's so true, yeah. So I have five kids, and I, I find myself often saying things that might sound a bit mean. I don't think they're mean, uh, but, like, what I'll, what I'll say is, like, if I give a, a discipline, like, hey, you were mean to your sister, you don't get to watch that movie, and they're just heartbroken, right? And I find myself saying things like, look, I don't care if you don't get to watch the movie. It doesn't bother me a bit, because what I care about is I care about your character, I care that you actually grow up and 
and have a, a good heart, a kind heart. That's what I care about. So, if, I mean, if I put these two together, like, you know, whether you get to watch a movie or whether you have a good character, it's no contest. I clearly care about, about the characters. So, um, yeah, that's a good point. So let's just, let's just end with this one, the idea that God hates fun. I want you to picture a young mouse and uh, his mouse parents, mice parents, and a picture of the mouse parents giving him yet another lecture on why he shouldn't eat the cheese that's on the little wooden platform with the metal coils. And he's not listening. He's rolling his eyes. He's thinking, oh, come on. You just don't want me to have any fun, right? There's the fish with her parents swimming along, and the parents look up. They see a plastic fish plop down into the water. Now, you make sure you stay away from that plastic fish. Don't even get close to it, and their daughter rolls her eyes and thinks, oh, my parents just don't want me to have any fun. Is it true that God hates fun? Well, it is true that God hates sin, and he, like, really hates it, really, really hates it. Why does he hate, him? Why does he hate sin so much? It's because he loves people. And if you love people, you hate what destroys people. Um, there's, a, there's a verse in, in Romans chapter 12, um, I think it's verse 9, that it says, uh, love must be without hypocrisy, which what that means is love must be genuine. Like you got to not just be an actor. Your love actually has to be real. And then it says this, it says love must be without hypocrisy. It says, uh, abhor what is evil and cling to what is good. So how do you make it to where your love is, is actually love. It's not just an act. Well, two things. One, you, you hate what is evil because you hate what destroys the people that you love. You hate what's evil and you cling to what's good. And then you know that your love is, is real. Um, that's, yeah, that's what I got. So let me just review real quick. Number one, God doesn't cause evil. He gives us free will and then we choose evil. Number two, God does care. He doesn't just say he loves us. He demonstrates it. He actually shows that he loves us. Uh, number three, God doesn't stay hidden. He reveals himself, and then he comes in person, and then he tells us to tell the whole world. Number four, God doesn't enjoy punishing. He isn't wishing for any to perish, and that means your friends. He doesn't wish for any of them to perish, but for all to come to repentance. And number five, God doesn't hate fun. He hates sin, which in the end is, is no fun. So when the tempter comes to you and says, you know what, you can't trust God, Two realities. Remember the haze that clouds up our vision. And number two, even more importantly, remember the rays that cut through the haze. And that's why you got to be in Scripture. you got to be reminding yourself of what's the truth in this disorienting reality that we find ourselves in. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for each, each person in this room. Each person is, is so valuable to you. you. You care so much about them. And uh, there are going to be days that we are tempted to be faithless, that we're tempted to be skeptical and cynical towards you, because that's our culture right now. Um, and help us, Lord, to hang on to uh, what we know to be true. And in those moments uh, that we would slice through the slander with, with faith and trust in you. We love you, Lord. And we thank you so much for loving us. It's in Jesus' name, amen.